Hello there everyone and welcome to another Martian Colonist live stream. If you're watching the recording, by all means, please continue to comment down below because I will be reading all of your comments. Today's exciting topic is going to be a follow-on from our last Mars mission update. Today we're going to be looking at how the new generation of super heavy lift vehicles, such as the Falcon Heavy, which we famously saw launch spectacularly in February, how can we use these rockets to explore the solar system, to go to new destinations, and to carry out new missions like none we have carried out before? So, all throughout this live stream, I will be monitoring your comments over there on the right. Firstly, though, we are going to be looking at a highlight section of some of the comments you left in my last Mars mission update two weeks ago. But first, I want to share with you a new exciting feature that we have on this channel. Now that we've reached 10,000 subscribers, we finally have access to the Community tab, which you can find over on my channel by going on the homepage and clicking on Community. This will enable you to see updates that I will post frequently on when my next Mars mission update will be coming out. You can see that I just early today put a poll up where you can suggest new ideas for new videos. We've already had about 30 of you voting on which of those three video suggestions I have there you would like to see, which is all based on comments that I've received. So please engage with that, and I will try to post relatively frequently to let you know when, in Ryan time, the next mission update will be coming out. So, on to our main topic for today. What I'm going to do when looking through the previous comments that you sent in is we're going to start by looking at your mission ideas that are close to Earth, and then gradually, progressively move further and further away to the outer edge of the solar system. So, some of the most popular suggestions of things you would like to see using to use super heavy lift vehicles for close to Earth is space tourism, and in particular, space hotels. So, we can kick this off with a nice comment from Astronis looking at space hotels in low Earth orbit. And in particular, a number of you said that you'd be interested to hear more about Bigelow Aerospace, which is working on a series of inflatable space hotels. They already have one docked to the International Space Station, and so of course they would like to hope to gradually launch increasingly large and more sophisticated modules, expanding them together into building a large commercial space uh, station in orbit for tourist purposes. So, um, a few other comments that you had concerning tourism. Um, some of you would be interested in seeing suborbital flights, for example, using a vehicle like Blue Origin's New Shepard, like uh, Zhao suggested there, and Santiago was very interested about doing a mission, a tourist mission around the moon. Um, now it's worth noting that, at least as far as I'm aware, SpaceX are no longer considering to carry out their lunar tourism mission using the Falcon Heavy. They believe it would be easier just to get the BFR ready, certify that for human spaceflight, and then send 100 or so people around the moon instead of the two or so you'd be able to do with the Falcon Heavy. But it wasn't only tourism. Low Earth orbit seemed to be a really popular destination that you had for doing missions to study the effects of partial gravity environments on the human body. Folks really kicked this conversation off by looking at how we could have a station in orbit, potentially rotating it around in order to generate artificial gravity. One of the comments that I received that I, was really, really helpful actually was from uh, Kent Nergbol, who has conducted an interesting study looking at how you could potentially use the Dragon 2 capsule to generate a partial gravity environment for testing various different gravity environments, such as moon, lunar gravity, Martian gravity, and Earth gravity, by simply taking a Dragon 2, putting a propulsion module on the bottom, and rotating it around which is an absolutely excellent idea for scientific research. Um, and there are, there are any number of applications that you could use this for. For instance, the Library of Oral Health in Microgravity uh, sent an interesting comment about how you could potentially use partial gravity environments and microgravity environments to artificially create superbugs effectively to study in a microgravity environment how various different microorganisms and bacteria actually behave for. Um, so to answer your, your comment, Yuraf, I'm looking at streaming for no more than an hour, probably about 45 minutes or so, uh, but if many of you do have comments you'd like to see addressed at the end, I will stay and answer those comments, and I'll probably edit and clip the video at the end. So 
those are just a few of the suggestions that you had about missions you would like to see in low Earth orbit. There were other proposals you raised, such as using things like the BFR to launch propellant tanks into orbit. Um, and um, there were even some interesting uh, comments looking at how we could even potentially do mega engineering experiments. Like, I'm sure a number of you know that I've made videos on space elevators before. Um, but there were other structures, such as space towers and space rings, that have been proposed. But that's probably something I should um, address in a future video going into greater depth in those various proposals. But the moon wasn't the... Uh, sorry, the Earth, I'm giving it away. Low Earth orbit wasn't the only game in town. Many of you were incredibly excited by the prospect of using super heavy vehicles to explore the moon. So I'm sure some of you have seen these beautiful artist concepts that the European Space Agency have put out, looking at how you could potentially use 3D printing to explore the moon. So this just symbolizes how there is a burgeoning desire 50 years or so, or almost 50 years after we sent the first Apollo missions to return to the moon. But not only to return, but also to build bases on the moon. So Shauna and Big J were very keen about the idea of building permanent human presences on the moon and using super heavy lift vehicles like the Falcon Heavy to make it cheaper and make it more affordable. Many of you elaborated on how you would like to see an industrial base on the moon. Um, so my, my personal viewpoint on this is that um, uh, and I'm sure many of you know that naturally I'm a Mars first person. I would like to see us having permanent human outposts on Mars, which seems to me to be the ideal place for us to live there in the long term. Um, in the very long term, eventually terraform the planet using technologies that we at least can conceive of today. But I do completely agree that the moon is a fantastic place for both industrial facilities and also for scientific research, having things like large radio arrays. So uh, I'm not dismissing the moon. We absolutely should go there. Um, but in terms of a place to live, I would probably favour Mars. So leaving the moon behind for a moment, why don't we go and look at near-Earth asteroids? Because a number of you were very interested in the prospects of eventually stepping towards asteroid mining initiatives, such as seen in this graphic from Deep Space Industries. But starting with near-Earth objects. So, for example, Pete Coons and John Fraser were very interested in using resources extracted from near-Earth objects in order to potentially synthesize fuels, for instance, that could be used to test technologies we would need to go further out there into space in general. Um, and not, not just for near-Earth asteroids, but also for the asteroid belt as a whole. If you want to gradually build a stepping stone once you have already explored Mars, to gradually push out to Jupiter, the moons of Jupiter and beyond, there are there's an incredible wealth of precious metals, such as gold, palladium, platinum, etc., that you will find in the asteroid belt. Um, so in many ways, um, people often ask me, why don't you mine Mars, for instance, um, which I, I don't think is a very viable business case because you've got to ship all the material out of a gravity well. But asteroids have the advantage that you can dissect them, extract the resources when there is very little gravitational field that the asteroids themselves possess, and then ship the resources wherever you need them in the solar system. And not just the heavy metals, but also things like um, water deposits in the form of ice, which you can break down to make rocket fuel to create um, orbital refueling repositories. Um, but it wasn't just missions to go and send people into space and to go and establish industry. Now, as a scientist, and in particular as an exoplanet researcher, I was extremely pleased to see how many scientific missions you were proposing. So, in particular, B. Berry and Carl, uh, Carl Femmel, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, were very interested in using super heavy lift vehicles such as the BFR in order to launch telescopes that are far more capable than the James Webb Space Telescope. So, I want to bring to your attention a telescope which is being proposed after James Webb, which is called Louvois. Um, so, can I remember the acronym? That's the interesting question. Um, uh, like ultraviolet, um, optical, and infrared, something along those lines. But uh, the point is that huge telescopes that could be as large as 15 or 16 metres, like Louvois, could do far more than James Webb can do, which can only really look in a little bit of the visible spectrum, but mostly in the infrared. So we could have missions that could characterise exoplanet atmospheres in excruciating detail. And if we have super heavy lift vehicles, not only can we launch these missions cheaper, 
But we could also mitigate some of the problems to do with unfurling the telescope. Um, which is actually one of the reasons why the James Webb Space Telescope was recently delayed by another year. Um, in fact, last year it was scheduled for 2018. Now it's looking like about May 2020, unfortunately, which um, uh, obviously I wasn't too happy with because I, I was hoping to be analysing the data from James Webb to profile exoplanet atmospheres within the next year. But uh, not to worry. Hopefully future vehicles like um, Louvoir launching on a BFR, for instance, wouldn't have to unfurl, which would make the mission somewhat technically simpler. But um, pushing deeper into the solar system, another type of scientific mission that people were particularly interested in was the idea of having gravitational wave observatories, which have much larger baselines than what we can do on the Earth, using things like the, the LIGO instrument, which famously detected gravitational waves a few years ago. This is similar to a mission that the European Space Agency is currently working on, which is called ELISA, which would have a, a network of three satellites in a triangular configuration beaming lasers between each other in order to measure the distortions of space-time caused by gravitational waves. And this would be substantially more sensitive than any instrument we can build on the Earth because of the huge distances between the various instruments. But now, as you might have guessed, We've looked at some of the missions in low Earth orbit, we've looked at the Moon, we've looked at the asteroids. So what's next? And of course, it's Mars, my favourite planet. <laughs> so I'll try not to ramble about Mars for too long, because I'm sure many of you have heard me talk about Mars a lot. Just to convince you that you actually asked about Mars. So here are three comments from um, Stig, Kaverick and Dylan saying that they really wanted to have people on Mars. This excellent comment from Haranga which was very interested in how we could use local resources on Mars to produce the gases that we would need for a base, such as oxygen, breathable air, extracting nitrogen from the Martian atmosphere, etc., uh, which is called in situ resource utilization. And NASA are actually currently working on an instrument called um, MOXIE, which will go on the Mars 2020 rover, which will actually, on a very limited scale, demonstrate in situ resource utilization like this. So that's something that's already being studied, but I absolutely agree. If you could use a super heavy lift vehicle to launch a more comprehensive demonstration mission, that would be absolutely fantastic. Some of you were also interested, such as Julian, in having an orbital base around Mars instead of immediately going down to the surface. Um, now, that's very similar to what Lockheed Martin had proposed for their Mars base camp proposal. Um, so I did discuss this in um, my Mars mission update from last October. So if you are interested, um, you can certainly check that one out if you want to know more about what Lockheed Martin would like to be able to do um, if they had almost infinite money. So uh, we've now reached Mars, but once you go further out into the solar system, which we absolutely can do with super heavy lift vehicles, then the science case gets really interesting. There are icy moons such as Europa around Jupiter and Enceladus around Saturn, and many of you were really excited by the prospects of this. So Sebastian and Thomas were really excited by the prospects of missions to Europa. Um, as Sebastian points out, if you want to have a lander on the surface, instead of using solar panels, you would probably have to use a um, radioisotope thermoelectric generator, an RTG, to produce electricity via nuclear power. And there are, of course, missions being studied like Europa Clipper, which would fly by Europa many times, diving in and out of Jupiter's radiation belt, um, because any instrument would get fried if you actually had it orbiting Europa without having an elliptical enough orbit to escape from the radiation belt. Um, I would absolutely love to see landers. I would like to see us fly through the plumes of Europa to collect samples, study it for potential microorganisms that could be present there. There's no shortage of missions. But by using a super heavy lift vehicle, we could get there faster. We could do direct injection missions to the moons of Jupiter instead of having to do a really long orbit that does multiple flybys of the Earth and other planets in the solar system to finally get out to the moons of Jupiter. So we can get there faster and we can get there cheaper. So in addition to the moons of Jupiter, a number of you were also excited by the prospects of missions to Titan, the moon of Saturn. Um, so I have a nice little animation here to illustrate what you could potentially do on Titan. Uh, this is an animation that NASA put together looking at how you could use 
a submarine swimming about in the various oceans of hydrocarbons on Titan to look for evidence of very exotic biochemistries. Because who knows, in Titan, we could, at those temperatures, we could have maybe an ammonia-based biochemistry instead of the water and carbon-based biochemistry that we have here on the Earth. So I would absolutely like to see missions to Titan. We could go further out. We could certainly go and take a look at Uranus. We could send missions to Neptune. And don't forget that we've only sent one flyby mission, which was Voyager 1, to explore Uranus and Neptune. Ideally, what we really need is to send orbiters to go look at Uranus and Neptune and examine their moons in detail. For example, uh, the moon Triton of Neptune is particularly fascinating for studying um, how you could have large, somewhat planetary mass bodies being captured into orbit. So um, potentially it could help us learn more about how the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos formed, for instance. Um, I am reading your comments. Um, I'm just getting through some of the comments we received in um, the last video, and we've almost finished those. And then I'm going to transition to look at um, the comments that you're sending in live, and then we'll go through those and have a nice discussion on any exciting ideas that you have for missions out there into the solar system. So fortunately, I was pleased to see that there was at least one of you that was interested in a mission to Pluto. Poor, poor, lonely Pluto. So uh, the sweet words asked if using missions like uh, using rockets such as the Falcon Heavy, we could potentially send a lander or an orbiter to Pluto instead of just a flyby mission. Uh, so the short answer is you could certainly send an orbiter to Pluto with about a similar mass to the New Horizons mission because the payload that you can send. Oh, and thanks very much, Rob Jones, for that kind super chat. Uh, do let me know if you have any questions and I'll be happy to take a look at those. And I'll see if I can put that towards trying to get a better microphone, for instance, to improve the audio quality in some of my videos. So thanks very much for that. So uh, Pluto, we could send an orbiter. Um, the total mass that you could send in the expendable form of the Falcon Heavy is about 3.5 metric tons to Pluto, about three times more than the New Horizons mission. So that should be enough to add sufficient fuel for you to break once you get there and be captured into an orbit around Pluto. So absolutely. So to, to conclude with the comments that we received in the last Mars mission update, I now want to give you one of my suggestions for a mission I would like to see with a future super heavy lift vehicle. As you might see from the format, we've already got out to Pluto. So is there anywhere beyond Pluto that we could go with a super heavy lift vehicle? And there absolutely is. Let me introduce to you the concept of the solar gravitational lens, which would require you to launch a one meter space telescope about 550 astronomical units away from the Earth, which is about 10 times further away than Pluto. So we're talking a substantial distance. At that distance, you can use the gravitational field of the sun, which Einstein's general relativity tells us distorts space and time as a lens to magnify distant objects. By using a solar gravitational lens mission, you could take direct photographic images of an exoplanet surface with a resolution of one kilometer. So imagine getting photos of the surface of Proxima Centauri, for instance, that looks similar to the New Horizons mission that we got from Pluto a few years ago. That would be an ideal precursor to eventually sending interstellar missions. So if, for instance, you were to use a rocket like the, uh, the Space Launch System in its Block 2 expendable configuration, and you were to launch a one meter space telescope to do a gravity assist around Jupiter, fly by the sun at a distance of about eight solar radii, and fling yourself out right to the edge of the solar system, it would only take about 30 years to get to the place where you could have a solar gravitational lens, which I think is an ideal precursor to map out exoplanets before you decide which ones you would like to try and send missions like Breakthrough Starshot are proposing to. Right, so that's it for the comments that you sent in in the last Mars mission update. There were many other excellent comments that you sent in. I did read through all 300 of them. Unfortunately, I could only get through about 30 or 40 of them today. So now what we're going to do is take a look at the comments that you're sending in live. So be sure to let me know any questions that you have or any conversations that you would like me to discuss. 
Uh, for instance, uh, Corp225 is asking, is that Skylon that we have behind me? And absolutely, that is a model of Skylon. And a number of you have asked me where you can get a model like that. Um, so for me, I actually had um, a, a tour of Reaction Engine's uh, facilities in the south of Oxford, which is where I got it. Um, the British Interplanetary Society used to um, have on their website a web shop that you could order them from. Um, I'm not aware of whether that shop is still up, but that's probably the best place to look, the British Interplanetary Society, if you want to see if you can get one of those models. Um, some of you also had comments asking whether I could get other models in the background. Um, absolutely, I'm really interested in ordering models, uh, like 3D printed models of the Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy. Um, let me know if you have any other suggestions, because that is absolutely something which is on my radar. Um, Super Jacko 8 asks if we could send missions to Eris potentially using a super heavy lift vehicle. Uh, yes, you could do a flyby, um, uh, at least using missions like uh, Rocket Fighter Falcon Heavy. Uh, probably not an orbiter. Maybe um, SLS Block 2 configuration could potentially do an Eris orbiter. But it would take so long to get out to Eris. You're, you're talking missions um, on the order of uh, 15 or so years in the best case scenario with a direct injection flyby. But sure, we should send missions out to the dwarf planets beyond Pluto. OK, so other comments that you have. Let's see. Ah, so um, and I'm afraid I probably will pronounce your name wrong. So sorry for that. Uh, Orgazan Ortsturk. Um, apologies. Um, so you're curious about 3D printing technology and how we could develop that. So. Um, there already are companies which are developing 3D printers um, for microgravity environments. There's already um, one on the International Space Station, for instance, that's already being used to synthesize very basic components, replacement tools, for instance. Um, so potentially, if we could use um, partial gravity simulators like the, um, the spinning revolving um, Dragon Lab 2, which I spoke about earlier, that would be a great way to simulate how 3D printers might work on Mars, for instance, on the moon. So um, I absolutely believe that local resource utilization, local manufacturing is the way to go if we want to have a long term sustainable presence on the moon and Mars. Um, OK, so other comments that you have. Um, ah, So uh, El Planeta Genesis asks whether I read Robert Zubrin's new plan to go to the moon with SpaceX's rockets. Uh, I haven't personally read that. Um, if you can post it in the comments after this video has gone up then I'll absolutely take a look at that. So thanks very much for that. Um, so more excitement for solar lens telescopes. Um, ah, so Blue Gil Bronco 2 asks whether I've seen the concept to use lasers to accelerate microprobes to interstellar destinations. Absolutely, the Breakthrough Starshot initiative. In fact, um, just um, over a week ago, I was at the, the UK Exoplanet Conference in Oxford presenting some of my research. And we had someone, um, one of the volunteers for Breakthrough Starshot there with a poster talking about the latest developments they've been working on. Uh, and one of the things they've been working on is um, very small miniaturized instruments for local measurements of the magnetic field of exoplanets such as Proxima Centauri. And um, when I saw a poster describing measuring the magnetic field of an exoplanet from actually being at the exoplanet, not a remote measurement, um, that's the kind of poster that I expected to see about 50 years from now. So it's amazing that people are actually talking about it. They're taking it seriously. Um, so all the right things are coming into place, really, for Breakthrough Starshot. Um, I routinely see papers being posted on the archive, looking at the, um, uh, the relativistic mathematics of accelerating the probes, looking at the interactions of the probes with the interstellar medium. So there's some great research going on on Breakthrough Starshot, and it's a topic I would really like to make an an in-depth video on because um, most of the videos that you find online about it are, are quite out of date now with um, the frontier research that they're actually doing on that. So um, Enzo Dolan asks, what do I think about the idea of a new Glen Heavy? So attaching two side boosters to the new Glen. So um, we do already know from one little um, teaser email that Jeff Bezos sent out that Blue Origin are looking at developing a new Armstrong but we don't know much about it. Potentially that could be a form of New Glenn Heavy. Um, but then given the, the technical issues that SpaceX encountered with getting the Falcon Heavy working and how moving forward for the BFR, they're just moving to a single large core, I wouldn't be surprised if Blue Origin follows a similar um, methodology of just making the vehicle diameter be larger for a single core. 
But um, who knows? Or maybe they could even add an extra stage. Um, even for New Glenn, Blue Origin want to have a three-stage rocket, for instance. So who knows? Um, that's the problem with Blue Origin. They're very, very secretive compared to SpaceX, unfortunately. So a few more of the comments. Um, so Mr. Jellybean asks how long it would take to build a lunar outpost. Um, the answer probably depends slightly on, well, A, are you building a outpost in lunar orbit or on the surface? And are you doing it with a traditional government contracting uh, framework where the government will pay any amount of money to do it as long as it gets done? Or do you have some kind of commercial competition? Um, for example, I would like to see a version of the, the COTS program, the, the Commercial Orbital um, Transportation Services that um, uh, SpaceX used to supply the International Space Station, but, all, but used to um, have various companies competing to send components of bases to the surface of the moon, for instance. Um, I do know that Blue Origin have behind the scenes been proposing missions called Blue Moon that would use this. So I would suggest that if we try and build a lunar base Try and keep it commercial, make sure there's competition, and then perhaps it could be done on the order of, I don't know, a 10, 15 to year project. So uh, thanks very much for um, that question. Uh, of course, Philip X2 asks about floating habitats on Venus, and I, I didn't mention Venus. Um, I can't believe that out of the 350 comments we received on the last video, only one of them were on Venus, and um, perhaps I overlooked that site, so apologies for not covering that. So. Yes, floating habitats on Venus. Um, I don't know, like missions like rockets like the Falcon Heavy probably alone wouldn't be able to build a large enough full on habitat. But you could certainly do demonstration missions where you send large balloon missions to Venus to at least test and develop the core technology. And then maybe something like um, having um, Earth Venus cyclers um, using something like a BFR class vehicle could eventually assemble the components in Venus orbit, deorbit it down to about the 50 kilometer altitude you would want to have those floating cities at. So maybe one day. Um, my suspicion is we'll probably have established outposts on Mars before we have large floating cities on Venus. But um, at least on the science side, I know many people that are working on Venus missions. So I'm confident that eventually we'll start to learn more about the technologies required for that. So uh, Zest for Life asks whether I have changed my mind or for the idea of going on a one-way ticket to Mars. So um, no, I, I, will, I would go on a one-way trip to Mars, absolutely. Um, tell me any company that's doing it and I'll be happily to sign up for them. Um, I still suspect, at least until we have things like the, the BFR um, up and running, that that may be the way we want to go if we want to have cheap missions to Mars and we're trying to rush there to establish the architecture. Um, so I would like to see the first crews that would go to Mars using a vehicle like the BFR um, go on a one-way mission to establish the fuel depot and the architecture that would be needed, um, because it just seems like a waste sending the first few people to Mars only to then bring them back and then throw away and discard all of the technical expertise they've acquired from staying on Mars for potentially two or four years. Um, you can, of course, let me know what your own views are, are on that. Um, who knows, potentially the BFR um, renders the issue of doing one emissions entirely redundant. Um, so let me know what you think. Um, so I'll take probably two or three more questions. So uh, Robert Cruz asks, um, isn't the, the L2 moon station a good starting point for a station? Um, so potentially, um, we still need to get more expertise with operating in the cislunar environment. Um, so, for instance, one mission I'm interested in is uh, China's proposed, um, uh, I believe it's the uh, Chengi 4 mission, correct me if I'm wrong, to land a probe, a uh, surface lander on the far side of the moon, um, and there haven't been any missions there, using a relay system to relay um, the um, very scientific data back. So um, that's probably a good initial mission to study having architecture in L2 around the moon, but... Um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I still have a fair amount of scepticism for proposals like the, the Deep Space Gateway, which could turn out to be quite expensive, particularly if you use the SLS for it. What chance of failure would I risk um, if I was personally going on a mission to Mars? So 
for me, an acceptable risk profile would probably on, be on the order of between 10 and 20 percent, um, which sounds quite high, of course. That, that's much higher than what was experienced for the Space Shuttle, which was um, between about 2 and 4 percent. But um, if you're doing something like a Mars mission and you have a chance to go there, inspire the world and to establish a new frontier for human exploration, then you have to be willing to take risks. So um, I think that's a good place probably to end the live stream today. Uh, thanks for everyone who tuned in. Thanks for all of your live comments and from all the comments that we had last time. Uh, I will be reading through all of the comments that you leave if you missed the live stream. And I see a few of you also had some, some comments on technical issues like um, audio distortion or video quality. Um, I'll take a look at those, get to the bottom and uh, see what I can do for future live streams. Um, so thanks very much for tuning in, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And um, oh, one final thing I will say, just to remind you if you tuned in late, don't forget to check out the new community page if you want to know when the next Mars mission update will be coming out. I'm currently targeting around the end of April, fingers crossed for that. And also you can vote on new video proposals that you would like to see. So you can find that just over on my channel page. So thanks very much, everyone, and bye for now.